Welcome. In this session, we'll be discussing about endocyanin green angiography. Endocyanin green angiography or ICGA is used to image the choroidal vasculature as we see here in this ICGA. The properties of endocyanin green or ICG enables choroidal imaging. ICG is a large molecule which is 98% bound to plasma proteins and so leakage through fenestrations of choriocapillaries is restricted and this is in contrast with sodium fluorescein which being a small molecule with only 80% being bound to plasma proteins can diffuse freely through the fenestrations of choriocapillaries and both the peak absorption and peak emission spectra of endocyanin green are in the near infrared range and these longer wavelengths can penetrate deeper into tissue and can pass more easily through pigments such as melanin and xanthophyll, blood, lipid exudates and mild media opacity such as cataract. So these three properties enable imaging of choroidal vasculature with endocyanin green angiography. Endocyanin green is actively excreted by liver into the bile and is rapidly removed from the body following intravenous injection. Ability of endocyanin green to fluoresce called cyanescence is weak and is only 4% that of fluorescein and so high resolution cameras are required to detect cyanescence of endocyanin green. Two camera systems are available for ICGA. One is a modified fundus camera using white light with an excitation and a barrier filter and can take only one image per second. And the other is a scanning laser ophthalmoscope based camera and use a laser excitation beam with a barrier filter and can take up to 12 images per second which is called video angiography whose example we will be seeing shortly. We have discussed about modified fundus camera and SLO and CSLO in a previous session. White field ICG is also available and is particularly useful for central serous choreoretinopathy and uveitis in which there can be a diffuse involvement of the choroid. So the procedure begins by dissolving the 25 mg of ICG powder in 5 ml of sterile water which comes in the same pack. And here it is important to note that sodium iodide is used to prevent crystallization of ICG dye in water. And as we will discuss later, ICGA should be done cautiously in patients with iodine or seafood allergy. The injection procedure is the same as sodium fluorescein and the solution is slowly injected intravenously. In contrast to sodium fluorescein, extravasation is well tolerated without any risk of tissue necrosis. Images are taken with the camera every 3 seconds for the initial 30 seconds after injection and then the frequency of capturing images is reduced but is continued till 40 minutes after the injection. So we will first see filling sequence of ICG dye particularly in the early phases of the ICGA with two examples. In the first examples we have still photos taken from the video and in the second example we will see the actual video. So in this first example we see in the early phase the choroidal vessels have started to fill and so has the retinal blood vessels. The choroidal vessels continue to fill. And in this photograph, the filling of the choroid as well as the retinal circulation is complete. So we see large choroidal vessels which lie in the posterior halers layer, the medium sized choroidal vessels which lie in the satellite's layer, and the smaller choroidal vessels or the choriocapillaries which lie most anteriorly in the choroid. And this is the video in which we will see the choroid filling first, following which the retinal circulation fills. and within a few seconds the choroidal circulation and the retinal circulation starts to fade. We see an area of abnormal hypersinescence here. The normal ICGA is usually divided into an early phase, a mid phase and a late phase. The early phase starts 2 seconds after the injection when the choroidal arteries and the choriocapillaries fill sequentially with early filling of the choroidal veins. And in most ICGAs, 
a choroidal watershed zone may be identified passing near the optic disc between the supply territories of the lateral and the medial posterior ciliary arteries. In the initial couple of seconds, the retinal vessels appear dark and so both in FA and ICGA, the choroidal circulation starts to fill earlier than the retinal circulation as dictated by the blood flow pattern. Also, in contrast to fluorescent angiography, in ICGA, the optic disc area appears relatively dark and on ICGA, the foveal avascular zone appears less dark because the longer wavelength light used penetrates xanthophyll and melanin better. Between 3 to 5 seconds following injection, the choroidal veins and the retinal arteries fill completely and between 6 seconds and 3 minutes, the watershed zone fills up, vortex veins can be identified and the choroidal arteries and the large choroidal veins start to fade. In the mid-phase between 3 and 15 minutes following injection, the choroidal and the retinal circulations continue to fade. And in the late phase occurring 15 minutes after the injection, the choroidal vessels appear hypocyanescent as seen here in this angiogram against background extravascular tissue staining. And retinal vessels are also not seen in the late phase. And this is the optic disc which remains hypofluorescent throughout ICGA in contrast to fluorescent angiography. Other normal blood vessels which may sometimes be identified include choriovaginal veins extending from the choroid passing through the sclera adjacent to the optic nerve and draining into the pile venous plexus and extra bulbar vessels lying outside the globe which can be identified in patients with thin sclera. Extra bulbar vessels can be distinguished from choroidal vessels because these extra bulbar vessels pulsate with cardiac pulse and change shape and position with eye movements. Abnormal ICGA can be hypocyanescence and hypercyanescence. Hypocyanescence can be due to blocked cyanescence from overlying blood as seen here in this angiogram corresponding to the subretinal hemorrhage from pigments, exudates and serous fluid. And this is in contrast to block fluorescence of fluorescent angiography in which the blockage of the underlying fluorescence is more complete. This is because the near infrared wavelengths used in ICGA can penetrate blood and other structures more efficiently. Filling defects can also result in hypocyanescence which may occur with occlusion of choroidal vessels as seen here in this area in this angiogram. Loss of choroidal tissue as may occur in active choroiditis as seen here bilaterally in these angiograms and we may note here that most active choroiditis lesions show hypocyanescence throughout ICGA but on FA demonstrate early hypofluorescence with late hyperfluorescence. Hypocyanescence on ICGA is also seen in macular atrophy of Stargardt's disease in which there is complete loss of choriocapillaries in the atrophic area. But atrophic area of geographic atrophy in non-neovascular age-related macular degeneration does not show ICG hypocyanescence. And so ICG is a modality to distinguish between Stargardt's disease and geographic atrophy. Hypercyanescence on ICG can occur with macular or choroidal neovascularization, pachychoroid, choroidal tumors and in other situations. Macular or choroidal neovascularization show two patterns of hypersinescence in middle phase of ICGA. One is called the hot spot when the area of hypersinescence is less than one disc diameter in size and the other is called plaque when the area of hypersinescence is more than one disc diameter in size. And there are three situations of macular or choroidal neovascularization where ICGA can delineate the lesion better as compared to fluorescent angiography and this is important to remember. One is the occult choroidal neovascular membrane also called the type 1 choroidal neovascular membrane or the type 1 macular neovascularization which occurs between the retinal pigment epithelium and the Brax membrane in which the ICGA may reveal vessel networks and feeder vessels. The second one is idiopathic polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy or type 1 angiometrous macular neovascularization in which the earliest phases of the ICGA show branching vascular network or BVN 
as shown here in this angiogram. Shortly after, ICG accumulates in the angiometrous lesions and this is characterized by slow and sometimes pulsatile feeling corresponding to the orange colored lesions in the color image. Later, after 20 minutes, ICG dye uniformly disappears from these angiometrous lesions. And the third one is the retinal angiometrous proliferation also known as type 3 choroidal neovascular membrane or macular neovascularization and in these photographs we see the fundus photo here showing the hemorrhages the OCT showing the rap lesion here and the ICGA showing the abnormal vessels in this location Hypercyanescence on ICGA can also be seen in pachychoroid spectrum of diseases which are primarily choroidal diseases with thickening of the choroid which can be demonstrated on enhanced depth imaging optical coherence tomography and which we will be discussing in a separate session. And this pachychoroid spectrum of disease is characterized by dilatation of larger choroidal vessels, attenuation of choriocapillaries with risk of neovascularization. And this pachychoroid spectrum of diseases includes entities such as central serous choreoretinopathy and polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy. So, in this ICG angiogram of a patient with pachychoroid, we find multifocal areas of choroidal hyperpermeability along with a hot spot. And in patients with central serous choreoretinopathy, when we compare their fluorescent angiograms with their corresponding ICG angiograms, we find more areas of leakage in their ICG angiograms as compared to their fluorescent angiograms. And in this late phase angiogram, we also find dilatation of choroidal veins. On ICGA choroidal hemangioma patients in early phase shows rapid well-defined area of filling in a lobular pattern. Later, this filling becomes complete as seen here in this ICGA and characteristically the ICG dye exits from the tumor in subsequent phases with hypocyanescence of the tumor surrounded by a hypercyanescent ring. And in choroidal melanoma patients, ICGA can demonstrate the microvascular network in the tumor against a dark background. And in patients with choroidal metastasis, a hypocyanescent lesion is seen but with absence of any intrinsic microvascular network. So this is a patient of choroidal metastasis showing hypocyanescence on ICGA and this metastasis was from a lung cancer. Other causes of hypersinescence on ICGA include vortex vein varicosities and these lesions change in shape and position with eye movements and are collapsible on compression of the eye. Hypersinescence can also be seen peripherally in peripheral exudative hemorrhagic choreoretinopathy which can be considered to be a peripheral form of neovascular age-related degeneration. Complications of ICG are similar to fluorescent angiography with mild complications being nausea, vomiting, sneezing and pruritus but mild complications on ICG are less frequent as compared with fluorescent angiography. Moderate complications include urticaria, pyrexia, syncope and nerve palsy and severe complications such as anaphylaxis occur with same frequency in indocyanin green angiography and fluorescent angiography. Precautions and relative contraindications to ICGA include iodine or seafood allergy because as we have mentioned sodium iodide is used in the preparation to prevent crystallization of the dye and in these patients infracyanin green can be used instead. Precautions should also be taken in liver failure patients, kidney failure patients, particularly in patients on dialysis who have a higher incidence of side effects in patients who had side effects in previous ICG sessions and in pregnant and lactating patients. We may note here that these three are relative contraindications to ICGA but are not considered as contraindications to FA. To recap the salient points, Indocyanin green angiography is used to visualize the choroidal vasculature. ICG has its absorption and emission peak in the near infrared spectrum, the wavelengths which penetrate deeper and more efficiently pass through retinal pigment epithelium. ICG is a large molecule which is 98% bound to plasma proteins and so ICG leaks much less as compared to fluorescein through the fenestrations of the choriocapillaries. These three properties enable better visualization of choroidal vasculature 
with ICG as compared with fluorescent angiography. In a normal ICG, choroidal arteries, capillaries and veins fill sequentially in the first few seconds. Retinal vessels fill following a brief delay. Within 1 to 3 minutes, the choroidal circulation starts to fade and after 15 minutes, the choroidal vessels appear as hypocyanescent structures against background extravascular staining. Hypocyanescence can occur due to blockage, choroidal vascular occlusion, active choroiditis, and macular atrophy of Stargardt's disease. Hypercyanescence can occur in choroidal or macular neovascularization, choroidal tumors such as hemangioma and melanoma, but not in choroidal metastasis, pachychoroid and vortex vein varicocities. Three types of choroidal or macular neovascularization are better visualized in ICGA as compared to FA. These include type 1 or occult choroidal neovascularization, idiopathic polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy, and retinal angiometrous proliferation. Complications of ICGA can be mild such as nausea, vomiting, pruritus, and sneezing, moderate such as urticaria, pyrexia, nerve palsy, and syncope, or severe such as anaphylactic shock. Precautions and relative contraindications include iodine allergy, liver failure, kidney failure, pregnancy and lactation, and allergic reactions occurring in previous ICGA sessions. Thank you for listening.